The topic uh, is, of course, the cleansing of the sanctuary. And um, we're going to consider it beginning here with uh, there are four basic doctrines that I use in my own studies with, uh, with people. And uh, the four, God, creation, sin, and atonement. It's kind of a systematic approach. And uh, I believe every doctrine comes under one or all of these four headings. In fact, there are some words that come under all of these. And I'll use an example of that with uh, love. What is the relationship between God and love? God is love. What about, what's the relationship between creation and love? Okay, it's an expression or a manifestation of the love of God. What about sin? What does sin do to God's heart of love? What would I hear? Okay, okay, I'm sorry, I got, yes, it breaks the heart of God, it grieves him greatly. And how about the atonement? The atonement plunges the very depths of the love of God for mankind. What he went through in Calvary, what he's going through now, is an exhibition of his love for us. Now, here is a, this one I decided to put uh, early on. Uh, yesterday we were, a lady was, uh, and I was, we were talking and uh, she has a son that she has a great burden for. And I would say to her and to everyone here, never, never give up. N never stop praying. And I shared with her this statement, or I kind of paraphrased it, and I said, I'll put it on today. We can take a look at it. The background for my use of this, I used to teach, and we had a young man who was really bright, articulate, and uh, a good preacher. He came out of the drug culture. And then he went back into it again. But in the classes, I never, I never had students uh, uh, memorize. But I went over this statement time and time again. And he told me, years later, he called me up and he said, I've come back to Christ. And he said, the one thing that stuck in my mind all the time that I was running is that statement that you had from the spirit of prophecy. And this is it. Infinite love has cast up a pathway upon which the ransom of the Lord may pass from earth to heaven. That path is the Son of God. Angel guides are sent to direct our erring feet. Heaven's glorious ladder is let down in every man's path, barring his way to vice and folly. And that got to him after years. The Lord would not give up on him. He, he will not give up on you and I. Uh, if, if we're lost, it's because we deliberately turn away from him. We don't want to do that. All right, I want to come back to these four doctrines again. Um, what is the relationship between God and the sanctuary? Okay. He dwells between the cherubim, but it's called, the temple is called his, uh, his dwelling place. What about creation? How does creation fit in with the sanctuary? Think of the book of Revelation. Or there are other places too, the Psalms. Worship, praise of God in his sanctuary. What about sin? What did sin do to the sanctuary in heaven? Where did sin begin? began in heaven. The original sin is found in heaven, in Lucifer. Lucifer was so close to God that I cannot to, to this day figure out how he could be so close to God and yet sin in the presence of God and yet not decease. <laughs> but God in his mercy kept him alive. But sin defiled the heavenly sanctuary. And the atonement will cleanse the heavenly sanctuary of sin and of the record. Now, there, in the type, there are two, two kinds of atonement. Uh, the first is the atonement of forgiveness. You find that in chapter 4. Four times it's mentioned. For the priests, 
for the leaders, for the congregation, and for individuals that would come uh, with, with a lamb. Now, uh, because of this, there, there is another aspect of atonement that's beyond forgiveness. Where would that, where, I guess I've got it on there. The cleansing of the sanctuary is the blotting out of sin, and this was typified in chapter 16 of the book of, Le, uh, book of Leviticus. And um, the, the early days of Adventism, E.J. E. Wagner's father wrote a book on the atonement. And he tried to prove from Scripture that there was no atonement that took place at the cross that the atonement took place only in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. He wrote an entire book on this. Why he did not deal with chapter 4 of Leviticus, I don't know. <laughs> but it's clear that there's an atonement for, of forgiveness. You look those up, and it clearly says it was an atonement of forgiveness. The great day of atonement was one of the blotting out of sins, or the cleansing of the tabernacle, sanctuary, and of the people. And so here... Um, we need to be sure that we realize there's a difference between God's forgiveness and His blotting out of sin. The, um, if sins were blotted out at Calvary when He died, there is no need of the cleansing of the sanctuary beginning in 1844. It doesn't make any sense. In fact, some of the opposition that we have outside of Adventism, most of the people that oppose the 1844 message is because they believe that all sin was absolutely blotted out at Calvary. Your once saved, always saved uh, believers believe this very strongly. And, and so it doesn't make any sense to have a cleansing of the sanctuary in heaven or in the, in the, the life of the believer because you're already saved and there's nothing, nothing that can be added to it, so they say. And I remember I had, uh, I used to uh, study and work with uh, pastors of other denominations. And one time we were at a minister's, a Methodist minister's home, and he was going to share with us things about Methodism. And he said, well, I don't know anything about this that you don't know. You guys know what I believe. And, and uh, he said, so I don't have anything to say unless there's a question. There was no question. So dumb me, I asked, I raised the question. I said, uh, tell us about the uh, Wesley's doctrine of the second blessing. He said, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> and so, but there was another man there. It was a group that had come out. It was a holiness movement. I'm not going to mention the denomination. But they, they have their roots in Methodism, as we do. But Adventism took the route that <clears throat> there is a cleansing of the sanctuary in heaven. The holiness movement, especially those who believe in the second blessing, they believe that the Holy Spirit comes and does a special work after you're born again, after you've, uh, you know, after you've been changed. Uh, the Holy Spirit comes in again and gives you a second blessing so that you cannot sin. It's an impossibility. And if you sin, it's not really sin. Because my sin was blotted out at Calvary, or that's the idea of it. Well, this man was the head of a ministerial group in this place where I was living at the time. And... Uh, he hated Adventists, especially preachers. And then I knew it. <laughs> we met one time at the hospital. It was a public hospital. And he suggested that we have a preacher patrol and clean up all the books in the library that we, that we as preachers didn't approve. Well, I was sitting there. I knew what books we had in there. <laughs> uh, Uncle Arthur's Bible stories and bedtime stories and some of these things. Well, the Jehovah's Witnesses had books in there, and the Mormons had books in there. And uh, I didn't say anything. I just I, I said I'm not, uh, to myself, I'm not going to defend our own position uh, in this situation. But there was a little old nun sitting next to me. She said, oh, we can't get, get rid of those Bible stories by Uncle Arthur. <laughs> and so I said, you know... Um, I'm not here to defend our own publications. As, you know, as a Seventh-day Adventist, they knew I was an Adventist. But I'm going to defend the right of the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Mormons to have their books in this public place unless the administration kicks them out. This man who could not sin exploded. 
and there was shrapnel all over the place. <clears throat> and I, would, I really was concerned about it because uh, I had tried to get close to him and, and couldn't do it. It just, he wouldn't allow it. I started praying. I said, Lord, I don't know what to do. And unless you work something out, uh, <laughs> there's going to be enmity there. So I said, soften his heart, soften mine. Do you know in a few days, this man got sick and had to go to the hospital. And I beat a path to the hospital to pray with him. And I have a little book called The Problem of Human Suffering by uh, Elder Hubeck. Tremendous book. And um, so I, I, when I was leaving, I said, uh, would it be all right if we had a word of prayer? And he said, yeah, that'd be fine. So I prayed with him and I left him the book. He got out of the hospital shortly after that. I don't think anything was wrong with him. I think the Lord put him in the hospital. <laughs> but he got out and just a few weeks later, he called me and he said, would you preach in my church? <laughs> He, he said, now, I can't be there. Now, I, think of this. He did not trust Seventh-day Adventists. God worked to work in his heart. So that he, tr this man trusted me with his congregation <laughs> twice. And then when I left, I moved from that place. He came by and he said, uh, you know, he said, I want to come and talk to you before you leave. He said, you know, I hadn't had any much use for Seventh-day Adventist preachers. I said, yes, I gathered that. <laughs> And he said, but God has done something uh, to my heart. And he said, I think we're friends. I said, yes, I think so. He said, would you mind it if I prayed for you before you go? <laughs> and so we had a happy, happy departure. But his belief system was he could not accept uh, the cleansing of the sanctuary because everything was done at the cross and the Holy Spirit coming in uh, to him, so he thought. Uh, as a second blessing. But we run into that on a regular basis uh, outside of uh, Adventism. Now, <clears throat> when Christ died, our sins were legally forgiven, but not blotted out. Now, I know there's a lot of discussion on legal justification, but those who do, are opposing it do not know where justification comes from. It is a legal statement both secular and in the Bible. The very first time that the word is used legally is in Genesis. And so it is a, it's, uh, it, it is, it is a legal uh, statement. Uh, it did not come from Elder Wieland, he, but he knew the sources. Now, Acts 3.19 addresses when our sins will be blotted out. But before we get there, I want to come back to forgiveness. This is from the Mount of Blessings. God's forgiveness is not merely... What does the word merely mean? Not only, yes. Not merely a judicial act, but it is a judicial act by which he sets us free from condemnation. It is not only forgiveness for sin, but reclaiming from sin. It is the outflow of redeeming love that transforms the heart. But as two, it has to be legal and it has to be transforming. And when you separate those two, uh, people will, are, are going into apostasy. And so we need to be careful of that, of that very thing. Um, now, the blotting out of sin. Peter looked forward to the times of refreshing when he said, Repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out in the investigative judgment when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord and he shall send Jesus. Uh, this is from the Great Controversy, 88 edition, page 611. And the, uh, in, uh, the investigative judgment is in brackets. Uh, Ellen White doesn't really put it there, but it's during the, during the time that we're living in that the, uh, the sins are being blotted out. And um, here again, the blood of Christ, while it was to release the repentant sinner from the condemnation of the law, was not to ch cancel the sin it would stand on record in the sanctuary until the final atonement. Now, there are some among us, um, I don't know about any, anyone in this room, but I know there are some people who do not believe in a final atonement in the sanctuary. Some people believe it's only an application of what happened at Calvary. But it's more than an application. It's an actual cleansing of God's people and, and cleansing of the record. And... Um, uh, 
the, well, we'll get into something else a little bit later on, but Christ's work as high priest completes the divine plan of redemption by making the final atonement for sin. And this is in the heavenly sanctuary. Uh, that final atonement began in 1844. And in Daniel chapter 7, verse 9, we have movement of, of thrones in 1844. In fact, I think we'll, we'll go to the book of Daniel and look at some things here in, in this uh, chapter. Um, in, uh, the, in verse 9, it says that the thrones were set. There was a movement of, uh, of the thrones. And we have the same, we're going to come back to that, but I want to uh, bring this one out from uh, the book of Revelation, chapter 5 and verse 6. What we have, uh, we have the, the 12, 24 elders and the um, angels that are surrounding the throne. In the midst of the throne is a lamb who was slain. That lamb represented Christ crucified. So the cross of Christ or the, the very center of the throne of God is the cross of Jesus Christ. It reveals the character of God, of self-sacrificing love. This, his government is based on this principle. And, this, and Daniel is dealing with this, but he doesn't go into the detail of uh, what uh, John does in the book of Revelation. But in the atonement, we need to remember that Christ and him crucified, and I'm talking about the final atonement, Christ and him crucified is the basis for all judgment. And we come back to uh, Daniel uh, and the judgment in Daniel. And uh, in, in uh, chapter 9, we have the basis of the judgment, which is Christ crucified. And in, in Hebrew thinking, many times they will, they will give you a conclusion or the end of their thinking, but they'll start, uh, I mean, they'll work back to the cause. And that's what we have here. Chapter 9 is the basis of, the, uh, of a judgment, which is Christ and Him crucified. Chapter 8, it's the time of the judgment at the end of the 2300 days. Then in chapter 7, we have the nature of the judgment, which is investigative. By the way, all judgment is, is investigative. There's nothing apart from investigation. The, the judgment, the pre-advent judgment, is the only time that we can be saved, but it's, it's in, investigative in nature. There's a judgment during the millennium, but there's no grace, there's no mercy there. There's only justice. Now we have justice and mercy. At the end of the millennium, again, there's no, just, and there's no mercy or no grace. There's only justice. So the only time we can be saved is in the pre-advent investigative judgment. And uh, so now, uh, it's a legal scene. The books are open. The judgment is investigative in nature. Um, I want to share something that happened uh, some time ago, <clears throat> and you're probably familiar with the new theology. There were three students that came to me from uh, one of our colleges. I'd been giving uh, studies in the sanctuary, <clears throat> and they, I guess they decided they were going to come and change my mind. And this one guy came in, and he said, uh, uh, you know, there's only, there's, there's not, there's, the term investigative judgment is not in the scriptures. And I thought for a while, and at that time uh, there was some activity, but not a lot of not a, not a lot of things in my our uh, papers. But I said, "Well, I, you're probably right. Um, if if it were in the scripture, we would find it in all of our journals." And um, so I said, "I'll take take your word of that." But I want to ask a question. I think you're asking the wrong question. Uh, you know, the word uh, "substitute" is not found in scripture, but is it scriptural? And um, he got to thinking about it. And I said, let's go to the book of Daniel. And let's go there. Daniel, Daniel chapter 7. And, uh, and after you have the movement of the throne into the most holy place. And you know, that's quite a picture there of, uh, in fact, let's read it from verse 9. He said, I watched till the thrones were put in place or set. And the ancient of days was seated. His garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like wool. His throne was a fiery flame, its wheels a burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousands of thousands ministered to him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The picture, now that, the fire, evidently it was the, 
the, uh, the glory of his very nature uh, as it surrounds him and surrounds everything that comes in contact uh, with, uh, with him and with his throne. But then in verse 10, it says, oh, well, I read part of verse 10. The last part of verse 10, it says, the court was seated and the books were opened. And so I asked this young man, I said, uh, young man, there were two young men and, and one uh, lady, and one of the men was going to uh, marry her, uh, from what I assumed. Anyhow, um, I said, what do you do when, uh, when you open a book? Well, you read the contents, he said. I said, that's good. What else? Is another word that we could use? And um, he wouldn't say it, but I did. I said, what do we do? We investigate the contents of the, that's in the book. And I said, this is in a, in a court syst- uh, uh, scene, so it's an investigative judgment in the courts of heaven. And gave him a study on it, and he was convinced of it. The third, the other young man came back to my home later, and he said, you know, he, he told us when we got in the car, he said, I believe that uh, that, that man is correct, but his girlfriend, and now remember, these, these were all three theologic, uh, theology majors. The girlfriend says, we are not going, I don't care what he said, we're not going to believe it. And as far as I know, they, 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 did, uh, they did not, but they were going into the ministry, and uh, I don't know what happened to them. They never came back. So, um, but let's let's take a look at something else in the pre-advent judgment. There's a book of remembrance, and let's go to Malachi and read that. This is a tremendous passage um, for us. The last book here of the Old Testament, and um, Malachi chapter three. And uh, what do we have? Verse 16. Let's read 16 uh, through 18. Those who feared the Lord spoke to one another, and the Lord listened and heard them. So a book of remembrance was written before him for those who fear the Lord and who meditate on his name. They shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts, on the day that I make them my jewels. And I will spare them as a man spares his own son who serves him. Then you shall again discern between the righteous and the wicked, between one who serves God and one who does not serve him. This is part of the judgment. Before this thing is over with, if we're faithful to God, we will see the wickedness of the wicked. There will be a clear line of distinction between them. If we're on the side of those who refuse the message that God has given for these last days, uh, they're going to see nothing but enemies. But it's going to be clear before this thing ends up. But uh, in David, or I think it was Asaph that wrote this, if I remember correctly, uh, he said, you number my wanderings. He says, put my tears into your bottle. Are they not in your book? Now, I used to have a picture of it's called a tear bottle. I, don't, I couldn't find it. It was blocked out. I don't know why. But they're probably about that high. And when people were in distress or even uh, would be mourning for a child or a relative died, they would actually put tears into that uh, bottle. And this is evidently what, uh, what the psalmist is talking about. He says, put my tears in, in a bottle. Remember me in your book. And are they not written there? And so this is one of the one of the uh, books that will be open in the judgment. Now, concerning the record of sin in heaven, there's two, uh, uh, it deals with forgiveness, either forgiveness that's accepted and received or forgiveness that's rejected. And um, God's people, those who accept forgiveness, will welcome the judgment. It's not a message of doom and gloom. Uh, in uh, Psalm 82, uh, eight, he says, "Arise, arise, O God, judge the earth, for you shall inherit all nations." And this next one is on a personal business. Uh, oops, what happened? Did I? Huh. Oh, this this is it. I went too far. He says, "Examine me, O Lord, prove me, try my mind and my heart, for your loving kindness is before my eyes, and I have walked in your truth." So if a person is resting in Christ alone, we have no 
reason to forgive, uh, to fear in the judgment. The judgment is actually for us. It is not against us. Now, I've talked to third and fourth generation Adventists, including my wife, um, who seemed to be absolutely terrified of the judgment, of the pre-Advent judgment. I was not raised in Adventist, so it was good news to me. <laughs> the, uh, uh, when, I, you know, when I figured out God was on my side, it was not against me. And say, that's what, in the judgment, he's on our side. He's for us. And, uh, but, you know, my wife would not read the great controversy until after we were married, and she began to understand righteousness by faith. I don't know if she's in the audience or not. But, no, she doesn't mind. Uh, uh, but it was because of these concepts of 1888 that opened her heart and mind, she now loves to read the great controversy. She's not afraid. But the reason she was afraid, her, her, her dad was a pastor and later on a chaplain in the military. And in those days, when the pastors got around, got together, they talked about all the horror star stories and the wrath of God. And uh, she, was only, she said, I can remember when I was three years old. She said, it terrified me. I would run out of the room. She just could not come, naturally, she couldn't come to grips with it until she heard the good news of Jesus Christ and his salvation. And we, we, have, we, uh, we need not fear the judgment. Now, at the end of the investigative phase of the judgment, Christ is given the dominion that was lost by Adam. Micah 4.8 talks about this. And thou, O tower of the flock, this is speaking of Christ, the stronghold of the daughter of Zion, Unto thee shall it come, even the first dominion. That was the dominion that Adam gave up when he sinned. So Jesus receives the, the uh, kingdom and the dominion. And that's, uh, let's go back to uh, Daniel 7 again. And uh, notice that in verse, well, verse 13, 13 and 14, we have Christ coming as the Son of Man. He says, I was watching in the night visions, and behold, the one like the Son of Man Coming with the clouds of heaven, he came to the Ancient of Days. And we already saw the Ancient of Days had moved into the most holy place. And, uh, uh, and they brought him before, uh, near before him. Then to him, this is speaking of Christ, was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. Now in order to have in everlasting dominion, God's people must have everlasting life. And that's what God gives us. When he gives us everlasting life or the dominion, he's talking about pretty much the same thing here. But does Jesus keep it for himself? Now remember, he is our representative. Does he keep it for himself? No. And if we drop down um, in verse, eight, uh, verse 18, it says that, then I wish, oh, wait a minute. Yeah, verse yeah, 18. The saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. So Christ receives it for us. Then he gives it to those who continue to believe. And that's part of the investigator judgment. Uh, if we drop down, I think again, we'll take, oh, I guess I'll ask that question. But uh, 722, is very good. We'll read that. The judgment is made in favor of God's people. And they possess the kingdom again. That's in verse three times. This is brought out in scripture or in, in this passage. Verse twenty-two: The ancient of days came, and judgment was made in favor of the saints of the Most High. And the time came for the saints to possess the kingdom. Then we'll drop down to verses twenty-five and twenty-six. Maybe before we get yeah, twenty-five and twenty-six. Uh, it speaks about this little horn power. He says he has, he speaks pompous words against the Most High. He shall persecute the saints of the Most High, shall intend to change times and law. Then the saints shall be given into his hand for a time, times, and half a time. But the court shall be seated, and that would be after that time element, and they shall take away his dominion to consume and destroy it forever. And then notice verse 27. Then the kingdom and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominion shall serve and obey him. So you have the, um, 
the kingdom, Christ receiving it for us, then he gives it to us. And you got another party here that we've read about, this little horn power, uh, who ruled from 538 to 1798. He comes up in the judgment. Now, why would the little horn power come up in the judgment? I thought it was only for Christians. It's for anyone who professes Christianity. And it's in the investigator judgment that a separation will be made between those who truly believe and those who do not. This power does not believe in Jesus Christ for salvation alone in Him. Now, there are many people in that system that do. But I would say the hierarchy is bought beyond repair. There are some within the hierarchy on an individual basis that will respond to the third angel's message, but most of them will not. <clears throat> the principle of, of this little horn is to blaspheme God, to not believe the Bible, but have, uh, have an o their own set of rules uh, by which they judge, judge others. But here's some good news. In, this is in the investigative judgment. By human tribunals, the children of God have been adjudged as the vilest of, of criminals. But the day is near when God is judge himself. Then the decisions of earth shall be reversed. Christ Object Lessons 179. And I would say on an individual basis where if people have been uh, harassing you, giving you a hard time, uh, and you can't see any way out, <laughs> hang on. Don't, don't give up. The time is coming when God is going to turn this on its head. He's going to reverse every decision that's been made against God's people uh, on the face of the earth. So it's good news in the judgment. Justice as well as mercy and grace are involved in the pre-advent judgment. I think I mentioned that earlier. No, I didn't. I, said it was, I think the next one is the one I was referring to. There will be neither grace nor mercy offered to the lost in the judgment after probation closes. This is the only time that we can receive grace and mercy and righteousness by faith in Christ alone. Two principles of the judgment. Number one is responsibility. Number two is accountability. Every person, now you and I, if we believe, well, no, let, let me back up another step. Did Jesus become responsible for the sins of mankind? All the sins? Okay. Who was accountable for our sins? A little weak there. <laughs> Who was accountable? Was it not Christ? Christ became responsible. He was made to be sin for us. And he was accountable. He died for us. He exhausted the penalty that was against us. That is what he's claiming in heaven today. In, uh, in, the, in the type, you, had, you have two things in the type that uh, symbolize the work of Christ. Well, first, you have the law of God. You have the death of the animal, which represented the crucifixion of Christ. And you have the offering of incense. The incense does not mean prayers. It means the righteousness of Jesus Christ. The sins, I mean, the, the, the prayers are seen as ascending as or with the incense. And that's what we have in Revelation uh, chapter 8 especially. But the incense was so sacred that if they made anything that smelled like it, there was a death penalty. And you read that in Exodus, I believe it's chapter 30 or 31. But it, it's because there can be no manufactured righteousness. There's only one true righteousness, and that's Christ's righteousness. And the only righteousness on the, on the face of the earth today is a faith righteousness. The faith of Jesus Christ that he gives to us. Now, uh, but those who reject what Christ has done, that where he's taken their responsibility and their accountability, they will face that judgment because they will be responsible for the sins which they've committed and they will be accountable for them. And that will come especially at the end of the millennium. Now, this is what Wagner had to say about the judgment. And this, God has wrought out salvation for every man and has given it to him but the majority spurn it and throw it away. The judgment will reveal the fact that full and complete salvation was given to every man 
and that the lost have deliberately thrown away their birthright possession. Thus, every mouth will be stopped. You find that in Glad Tidings, pages 22 and 23. By the way, if, uh, let's see, it may have been in this, this uh, week's lesson, I'm not sure. But the book of Galatians that we're studying, uh, if you want to get, get a good commentary on the book of Galatians, pick up Wagner's book on Galatians, the Gospel in Galatians, with Glad Tidings. Now, God's court of judgment gives the kingdom to His people. As I mentioned earlier, it's an everlasting kingdom. And the only way we can have it everlastingly is by having everlasting life. And that comes only through Jesus Christ. The final atonement involves cleansing the record, the record of sin in heaven and in our brains. Buried away in the cells of your brain and mine are different memories dating back to our early infancy. The brain records several things. The choices we make the thoughts we think, the words we utter, the actions we perform, the emotions we experience, and the habits we form. It's all there. Everything we've ever done, especially if it goes into long-term memory. It is permanent. The only way they can be erased is by destroying the brain or by God doing surgery on it. But that's the purpose of the investigative judgment, pre-advent judgment is to cleanse what's going on in the brain as well as the record in heaven. Uh, the, the record in heaven is simply a mirror of what, what's going on in our brains. Uh, now, whenever a person does something long enough, it becomes part of him. Habits are something hard to change because we become comfortable with them and because they become unconscious responses. It usually takes about three weeks to, be, uh, to become comfortable with a new habit. And it'll take another three weeks to make that habit a part of yourself and myself. But we need to remember that when changes are taking place, God will never give up on us while habits are being changed. If we're willing, we must not give up on God. We must not be discouraged. But come to, Even in the, in the most dire circumstances, and I've, I've been there, I know what I'm talking about, I've gone to God and said, God, I hate what's going on. And I was angry. But I said, thank you for it. <laughs> I believe that you'll, you'll lead me through this. And he did. And he does. <laughs> How many of you can ride a bicycle? Got a few hands. <laughs> I'm not trying to surprise anybody. Now, did you get on that bicycle and ride it immediately? Just boom. In fact, your dad or your mom may have put tra training wheels on it. We didn't have training wheels when I started. And so we crashed several times. But eventually we learned to ride the bicycle. I haven't been on it in a long time. And I'm sure it would be very wobbly to begin with. But I believe those habits would kick in and I'd be able to ride a bicycle. I, there was a time I hadn't skied for, for 20 years. And I was a little bit afraid to go up on the slope. But I went up. Do you know I never fell down once? <laughs> Those habits began to uh, operate. I, the balance was there. It was absolutely amazing. I should have fallen, but didn't. But those habits were there that I had learned 20 years before. How about tying a shoe? You know, I had a, a little girlfriend when I was in the first or second grade. I couldn't tie my shoes, so she'd tie them for me. <laughs> <clears throat> But I did learn to tie them. Now, that shoe tying, by the way, do you remember which shoe you put on this morning? First. Remember? Some left, some right. That's a habit. You do it unconsciously. You do it every day. That's, that's there. Now, it's coming back to the shoe tying situation. If someone would put a probe in your brain to the shoe tying memory, you would bend over and tie your shoes even if you were barefoot because of the habit. And that's what God is dealing with, with us. Now, he, He's not going to change those kinds of habits, but evil habits He will change. And... Um, 
We need to remember that nothing is, that we do is in strict literalness wiped out. It's there. And uh, this is what God has to do in the investigative judgment, pre-advent judgment. Every thought we've ever thought, now, and I'm talking now this about long-term memory. I'm not talking about short-term. But when it gets in long-term, it's there. Every thought is generated in, routed through, and stored within the brain. And it's recorded in heaven. And so the, the, the cleansing of the sanctuary involves the cleansing of the memories that are against God and the blotting out the evil that's within us. That doesn't mean it's, we're not going to have a struggle. There's going to be struggles for self is always number one. And it's only by the, the grace of Christ that we can be delivered from these things. But we need to remember this. There is a hand in the judgment that will never let us go. And in John 6, 37, I love these passages because there's a double negative in that passage, in that verse. Usually in the English language, if we have a double negative, it makes a positive out of it. But these are, in the original language, there's two different words, and it means never, no, absolutely ever will God let us go. Now, you may think, well, I've tried before and I've failed. But failure does not mean final defeat, even in the day of the final atonement. Atonement's not going to close on you, or the judgment's not going to close on you, so long as you believe in Christ. Now here, this is from, I believe, Desire of Ages. Yeah. Faith comes by the Word of God. Then grasp His promise. Him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. Quoting John 6. Cast yourself at His feet with a cry, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. You can never perish while you do this. Never. Now, I don't think she, Ellen White knew any Greek. But she understands the concept. It had to come from somewhere else. Unless she would have read about it. But I, I don't think so. I think God gave it to her. Desire of Ages 429. Here's another one that should bring hope to us. We can be as safe today in the investigative judgment as though we were already inside the city of God. Let's, let's, let's read this. Um, and this was uh, to a lady, I believe it was 1892 or 4, um, Lizzie Inns. And she was terribly discouraged. And Ellen White wrote to her. She says, the message from God to me for you is, him that cometh unto me, I will in no wise cast out. If you have nothing else to plead before God. Now think of it, we're talking about in terms of the investigative judgment, pre-advent judgment. If you have nothing to plead before God in this judgment, but there's one promise from your Lord and Savior, you have the assurance that you will never, never be turned away. It may seem to you that you are hanging on a single promise, but appropriate that one promise, and it will open to you the whole treasure house of the riches of the grace of Christ. Cling to that promise, and you are safe. Him that cometh unto me I will in no wise cast out. And this she closed. You are as safe as though inside the city of God. Now how could she say something like this? Jesus Christ is our representative in that city and in that temple in heaven. And it's as though you and I are there when we believe in Christ because He represents us. Paul talks about being sitting in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Well, we're here on the earth, but Christ is our representative in heaven. And He's our judge. And He's our high priest. And He's our mediator. <laughs> and He is our Adam, the second Adam. Now, there's another one. This is one of the last letters that she wrote. You'll find this in uh, Testimonies of Ministers, the last chapter. Jesus, and again, a lady that was discouraged. Jesus declares, Him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. That is, there is no possibility of my casting him out. For I have pledged my word to receive him. So long as God's word stands, that promise will stand. And it's eternal. And this will take us through even the pre-advent judgment. We hang by, by faith uh, in Christ alone. Here's another one. Grace, God's great teacher of righteousness. Titus 2.12. Uh, 
And now grace is unmerited favor, and that, but that includes the whole world. We're told by Ellen White that uh, uh, um, the atmosphere of grace surrounds the earth as, as well as the, earth, the uh, air we breathe. That's for everyone. Everyone lives because of the grace of God. That doesn't mean everyone's going to be saved if they do not accept it. But grace teaches us. This is on the, it comes on the inside. There's a power that works within also. Grace teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. And I want to illustrate this. This is a simple il illustration. But um, here we have within, physically within our brains, electrical and uh, physical aspect of our brains is where memory, memories, I believe, are located. But habits especially are. And so say you have cell number one, fires, and uh, say this is an evil habit. I used to drink, uh, used to smoke four, up to four packs of cigarettes a day. And, uh, um, and that, that, I'm sure that was happening in my system. Uh, in fact, I was in trouble one time with a wreck, or I was almost in a wreck. I should have died. I was coming down a, a mountain. I used to drive uh, off the highway equipment, and I had uh, about 20... 27 or 30 tons on that thing. And when we came come out from the shovel, we had to make a sharp, two sharp turns. And I was trying to navigate this, and I had to back up and turn, back up and turn, back up and turn. By the time I headed downhill, and you had to go down in first gear. When I kicked the thing back uh, out of reverse to go it in first, I was already going downhill, and I couldn't get, get, couldn't get the gear back, gearbox wouldn't take the shift. I went through every, <laughs> every gear, <laughs> nothing, high gear. <clears throat> I pulled the horn, there were guys in the bottom of the hill, and I, mountain, and I pulled that, beep, beep. <laughs> they couldn't hear me. I was standing up in that thing. So I tried to kick the door open. It was jammed, and I couldn't, couldn't do it. And I came down, and I knew that if I went off the edge of the mountain, I was dead. There was no way I could come out of it. But I saw a rock pile off to the right, and I decided I was going to go for that. I'd rather hit that and, and not roll. And so I turned, and the rock that was <clears throat> approaching that was soft. And so I came to a soft stop. Now, it caved the, it caved the front axle in, <clears throat> but I was so nervous, I jumped out of that thing, <laughs> I grabbed a cigarette, and threw it over my <laughs> shoulder. I just, I, it was amazing. But... I know that today, if I turn away from Christ, I hate tobacco, the smoke of it, or alcohol, I, I can't, can't, I don't want to even be around it. But I know that if I turn away from Christ, I would go right back to those evil habits. Peter tells us, what does it say? Just as a dog eats his own vomit. Have you ever seen a dog do that? Yeah, I've got a picture of one doing it. Or as a sow or a pig goes back to his uh, mud, you can, you can scrub them up. They make, look really nice. But give them a chance, they'll go right back to the mud puddle. And that's what Peter was saying with us. It's only by the grace of God that we can be saved. It's only by the grace of God that we can be kept. It's only by the grace of God that we can be cleansed in the time of the investigative judgment. But anyhow, say this... Uh, this, this uh, um, Cell is firing, and a, it's a well-patterned uh, well habit. And so God comes along, and he says, uh, you need to stop that. <laughs> and he knows it's impossible, but he has built within us a chemical factory, if you please, uh, another cell that puts out, uh, called, well, they call it uh, a GABA, uh, that says no. And um, it's like the brakes on a car. And here, uh, it, it, it prevents that cell from firing. Now, but it has to be a strong no. It can't be a weak one. I think this next one, yeah, the cell that delivers the most energy by at least 10 millivolts, which is not very much, that determines what cell number two will do. And, uh, and I know this to be true, again, experientially. Uh, I was in a hotel room by myself one time, and my old, an old habit came back to my mind with force. And I was in the process 
of indulging. I wasn't praying, but God sent a message by a thought. He says, just say no. And I got mad. I wasn't mad at God. I was mad at myself. I said, no, I'm not going to go that route. Immediately, the power of that temptation went away from me. It has never attacked me again. It's been several years now. Try it. <laughs> See if you won't like it. Now, there's another one that I, that I uh, pray almost daily, and that is from Volume 5 of the Testimonies, where she's dealing with a young man who was an alcoholic, and he, was, he turned away from God and from people. She was trying to encourage him. Encourage him. But she's, in there she said, um, as soon as you surrender your will to God, he immediately takes possession of it. <laughs> I think it's about 512, if I remember correctly. Tremendous promise. But if God can have a willing heart, and that's a willing to be made with, there have been times I haven't even been willing. I said, God, I don't want it, but I'm willing to be made willing. And he's the one that must make us willing even. By his grace, again. Now, coming back to this, um, if, uh, say on Sabbath uh, afternoon, you're visiting at a home, and the uh, hostess feeds you very well. You know you've eaten too much. And she comes by with a wonderful piece, your favorite pie. And you said, "Uh, well, no, I don't think I should. What are you going to do? You're going to do it. That's right. (laughs) She comes back a second time, and she says, "Uh, um, I've only got one piece. Are we ready to quit? (laughs) <laughs> I'm not through. <laughs> Just this is only introductory. <laughs> the, uh, no. Uh, the uh, now, if if you're in that kind of a situation, I think all of us are at some time or another. You don't have to say it. No, out loud. You can say. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> and the brain gets the signal. Uh, and, this, and I know this works. It, I've seen it work in my life and the life, life of others. And I got this from um, Eldon Chalmers. He used to teach at um, Barron Springs. He wrote a book, Healing the Broken Brain, which is pretty good. Now, with this, uh, are we out of time? Of course, we're going to have question and answer, aren't we? <laughs> there, <laughs> there will be no, no question, I'm sure. sure. Oh, <laughs> okay. All right, all right. Uh, let, let me drop down, because there's something we haven't... Uh, I, I've got to do something here, and I will do it quickly, I think. Um, say the... Uh, I had a statement by Jones here, but yeah, this is the one here. I want, I want probably end up with this. Um, the standard in the judgment is the law of love. Now, coming back again <clears throat> to those four doctrines, God is a God of love. His creation is His love, but it's also they respond by love. Sin grieves the heart of God. The atonement plunges the depths of the love of God. Now, in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 14, Paul wrote, he says, Above all things, put on love, which is the bond or the seal of perfection. Would you believe that the seal of God is the love of God? It's his character. It's his name. So here's a statement. Those who love God have the seal of God in their foreheads. Now the beast has a mark. That word mark, I think it's eight times in the book of Revelation, is character. And so we're dealing with two sets of characters, the character of God and the character of the enemy. And the choice will be ours in the judgment, uh, which it will be. The law of love is the transcript of God's character. Now, I want to do a paraphrase. You're familiar with with the love, that love section. This is a paraphrase. God suffers long and is kind. God does not envy. God does not parade himself. He is not puffed up. God does not behave rudely. God does not seek his own pleasure. God is never provoked. 
he thinks no evil. God does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. God bears all things. He believes all things. He hopes all things. He endures all things. God never fails. Now, when you're alone, take your Bible and read and put your name there. This is what God wants to do for us. He wants his love to be a part of us habitually. <laughs> With that, I better stop. <laughs> okay. <laughs>